This grew, we, we got, I can't remember the final number, something like 10 million uh, registered users. And we were getting at, at the peak um, four or five million unique organic visitors a month to the site. Today we have Ian Cohen. He's the CEO of Locker. And uh, prior to Locker, uh, he was the founder of a creative uh, content marketing agency, Alec Creative, uh, which then got acquired. He sold that to credit.com and built, he then became CEO of credit.com and, and sold that as well. So uh, this has been long overdue because uh, ever since I met you, Ian, I've really been wanting to hear those stories. So. Now I get to pick your brain uh, about uh, you know your lessons learned and also how you kind of built an amazing content marketing engine to to drive business. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, look, I kind of want to hear your story too, so I'm going to grow you a little bit through this. Sure. Okay. Yeah. 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 I love the way you're you built out your firm. So I think that that uh, look, my career started as you put it, or the career that where you started the story with. Uh, Alec Creative Partners, and that's an agency. You've created an agency, so I, I'm kind of wondering what you're going to do next, too. But we can, start, <laughs> we can start with me, okay? Yeah, yeah. So, what uh, what compelled you to create a, a content marketing agency? Um, it was a total accident. Um, so, what happened was the I was working as a product developer in online uh, education. So, I had, uh, was working um, doing online learning. And we were doing work for the National Science Foundation and um, uh, the EPA. So we would create these online learning modules. And we were working with a, a really famous, uh, we were working for a really famous um, uh, learning expert, computer science expert called Roger Shank, who had uh, founded the Institute for Learning Sciences at Northwestern. So I, I'm not gonna get into that whole backstory, but the short of it is that they'd created these artificial intelligence systems to film experts. So we would film these, you know, really top notch uh, subject matter experts in whatever we were working on. So one of these courses, for example, was what happens if the dirty bomb goes off. Another one was mm. um, cybersecurity, uh, cybersecurity course uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. So we'd interview these top notch experts in front of a camera and then index these videos in a very interesting way so that the learner could ask questions directly to these experts. And this is, remember, way, way, way before YouTube. So at the time, it all sounded very novel. But, but literally, the, the, you, your question about Alex started there because what we were really doing was called story-based you know, learning. Um, so you're, well, it's called goal-based learning, but it's really about following a narrative story from beginning to end. So the kinds of stories they would tell would be like the student might be posed a question. What happens if, you know, all the wolves in Yellowstone National Park are dying? Um, let's figure out what's going on. How do you do a, you know, a case study on this and differential diagnoses and all this kind of stuff. So I did not work on that particular course. But the point was that we were telling stories and then the group of us would then write up these stories into a learning module um, with video and everything else. So. Who's really good at telling stories? Who's really good at interviewing a physicist and distilling that down into interesting content material? Journalists. So in the beginning, we were hiring, you know, educational writers, and as the uh, as we started to expand into more and more of these um, um, scenarios, and we were growing that company, um, we started hiring journalists. So. I ended up working with a lot of journalists that that you know would do precisely what I, I I'm talking about. They would interview a physicist for a physics you know for a physics course, and um, you know turn that into a story that a person who's not a physicist could understand. So we ended up building up a pretty good group of these these journalists. And when I left that job, I started. Um, Alec Creative Partners. Uh, Alec is just the initial the initials of, of me and my co-founder. And we had about seven of these journalists to start with. And what we were doing was content-based marketing. Now, um, you know, just literally what that meant was we were writing stories that went through the full editorial process 
it was real journalism. It was not advertorial in any way. That was the secret of, of content marketing back then. So, um, so we would write actual, you know, articles that got published to major news outlets. And I'll explain how that worked in a minute. And then what would happen is, th so we would write, you know, free journalism for these news outlets. They would give us all the backlinks. So back then, you know, I, I think, you know, in the early 2000s, journalism was just, you know, really taking a hit. So what would literally happen would be um, Yahoo or MSM would, would you know, uh, fire one of their writers. We would hire one of their writers and then publish the content back to the same outlet. Yeah. But, 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 get all the, but get all the links. So it was a beautiful arrangement, right? So we got, we were focused on a couple of areas, consumer advocacy, um, privacy, identity theft. So we started writing, you know, a lot around um, uh, consumer credit, uh, consumer rights, uh, you know, things like the, the CFPB when that got started after the financial crash, we were writing about that. So one of our clients was credit.com. And I can dive more into how content marketing worked back then. But I think that the, the easiest way to explain it is, as I just said, more and more news outlets, um, as they started to, as their profits started to decline, uh, we're cutting back on staff. We'd literally rehire them and say, we'll give you the same content back. You just right. need so to they, send they get it for free, sort of, and you get the backlinks. Yep. And in fact, some of them even paid us for it. So, um, so, so one of our clients was credit.com and a really neat company and credit.com it's, it's, uh, one of its co-founders was um, my business partner at Alec. Mm. So it was a fairly simple merger uh, there. And Credit.com had created uh, a pretty decent sized following based on the fact that my partner, Adam Levin, was doing so much writing. Adam came out of politics in New Jersey and he was actually the director of consumer affairs in the early days in New Jersey. So uh, you, you can see the common thread here about consumer advocacy and yeah. privacy and data rights. And so anyway, um, credit.com had really been, you know, uh, uh, among other things, a publishing platform for, for, for him. And it also built up a lead generation business. Anyway, I came into credit.com uh, right at the beginning of the financial crash. And so it was a really interesting time um, because when the financial crash happened, two very big things happened for credit.com. One is credit became a household word. Everybody became credit aware is the way we phrased it. And we had just put out this free tool called the credit report card. Um, this was about a month before credit karma opened up. So we had this super novel idea the same time as karma that let's buy you know credit data give it to the consumer for free and um that should be a really easy way to get people to sign up at our site and then the way we would monetize that would be that if we are doing lead generation for credit cards or loans i mean we can massively increase the conversion rate for these customers because they know their credit coming in. So, mm -hmm. you know, with a little bit of back then, we wouldn't even call it machine learning, just a little bit of regression. <laughs> it doesn't take that much work to increase the conversion rate by four five, six times. Yeah. So the result there is the bank's super happy because they're getting good leads. The consumer is super happy because they're getting approved and we all feel great about ourselves, right? So what happened was we became, so the, 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 the financial crisis hit and this was my first CEO gig. Uh, and so I'm sitting there with this, you know, massive, uh, you know, demand for everybody wanting to know their credit score and figure out all, all their, the, the problems with their mortgages. So we got tons of traffic, um, tons of traffic based on, you know, the, the reputation credit.com had already created, but also the content marketing we were growing. Um, but there was no credit to give out. So, so we were, we were getting lots and lot, we were spending a lot of money pulling credit reports to give away to customers for free and not making a lot of money because there was no credit available. Mm -hmm. Banks were not issuing credit cards and, uh, or loans or anything else for that matter. But we held on through that period um, and grew our content marketing team to 
um, probably 15 or 20 full-time people. But on top of the full-time people, we had about 80 contributors. Yeah. Were the full-time so, people journalists as well, or are they mostly yeah. journalists? Oh, we had a lot more than, uh, I'm sorry, these are just the journalists. We had many more employees than 15. I'm talking about 15 yeah. journalists. journalists on staff. Yeah. And they ran it like a newsroom uh, at 9 a.m. every morning. They'd have their stand-up meeting and we'd go through, you know, pitching and everything else. And uh, then it would go through a, a, you know, editorial process like any newspaper has. But, but anyway, we ended up with a whole bunch of contributors and some of them were politicians. We, we even had at one point, I think Elizabeth Warren and Eric Cantor writing on our site, not every day, but you know, once a quarter. Um, and so it became a platform because like any other, you know, uh, publication, we had a pretty big reach. So people wanted to write for us. And so we ended up getting a great model where people would write for us just for the exposure or for the backlinks to their own, you know, website. And so we got, you know, I, I think incredibly cheap traffic relative to our competitors. Mm -hmm. And acquisition cost is everything in that space. So for a lot of people working in lead generation, which is kind of, a, 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 I think, undersells what we were doing, but because we were actually doing quite a bit of um, calculation, we weren't just sitting there showing ads on the site. We were trying to show people what they could get approved for in the best terms they could get. Anyway, we, you know, the, the name of the game there is, you know, the difference between CAC, you know, customer acquisition cost and, you know, what your average revenue per, per unit is. And so ours was amazing because our acquisition costs were, you know, nominal, you know, we would write an article and if it hit the front page of Yahoo, we'd get hundred, 200,000 visits in hours. And so the business grew, we, we got, I can't remember the final number, something like 10 million uh, registered users. And we were getting it at the peak, um, four or five million unique organic visitors a month to the site. And so that, that business was so much fun. Um, we ended up selling it and uh, it commenced in 2015 to HIG Capital and one of their portfolio companies. Um, and at the time, like I'd say, like we, we did well with it. I can't say how well, but we did well with it. I have to say, when I see Credit Karma selling to Intuit for billions, uh, <laughs> yeah, it kind of makes you wonder um, if we if we went out too early. But at the end of the day, who knows? Maybe if we didn't sell them, we would have gotten crushed by Credit Karma completely. And so, so I'm not complaining. Um, so we sold the the company, and I uh, stuck around for um, just a little under a year. had a had a good time. When you sell a company, it's an interesting. We raised money. We yeah, raised. You, you did raise money. Yeah, we raised. So, Credit.com though was already. It, it was. It was an interesting company because it was the the word would be bootstrapped, right? Mm -hmm. But one, you know, really, it was funded by Adam in the mm. beginning. Um, and then we did raise some money. We we took on VC debt because we were at a point where. For better or worse, like so, the advantage of raising money from the beginning is you increase your valuation by having institutional investors that declare your company is worth X dollars. Yeah, you don't have that; you're invariably worth less. Um, you know, for for no logical reason except that people pay what somebody else has declared your worth. Yeah. So, because we had revenue coming in, we were able to raise debt, which means that we had less dilution very little dilution in fact so so it's kind of a mixed bag which way do you want to go so we ended up raising um you know a fair amount of vc debt we we had lines of credit we factored our receivables but we didn't have to go out and do a big dilutive round um and so that was actually as a ceo a real benefit because i could spend time growing the company rather than go out there and raise money um but even raising vc debt was actually fairly time consuming because you're you're talking to just as many people as you would talk to if you were raising an equity round, but you don't suffer the dilution. Yeah. Um, so in any case, uh, after we sold the company, um, you know, I went through the withdrawals of not being a CEO anymore, which in hindsight <laughs> is just insane. It's like being a CEO is a super hard job. Like it, it's, 
I've, I've watched other people um, when they sell their companies and, and I, I know a lot of, the, you know, I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs now because they do seed investing as well as running a company. And I, I just, it blows my mind um, how much I look back at that time and go, well, why didn't you just go on vacation for six months? Um, <laughs> you know, that's, that's what I should have done. And I did eventually do that. I'll tell that story in a minute, but no, I mean, you, you know, there's this addiction to, working just growing hours and um you know yeah. all the things that go along with running a startup you, you know you it becomes the norm for you and breaking that norm you realize that like you've just put so much of your identity and yourself into this company yeah um so one of the biggest lessons is you know for people who are leaving companies is just like breathe you know like yeah I think it's it's also weird that no matter how great your reputation is, no matter how much opportunity you might have in reality, there's this sense of, you know, I, at least I felt it, that I needed to figure out what I was going to do next right away, like that my street value was highest right then. And I couldn't afford to, to relax for a minute because that had just been the norm for so long. Yeah. So I did. But I left that. I left. Um, you have to resell credit.com. I, I left after about a year and I took a job at Experian and I had been, Experian had been both a partner and a vendor to credit.com and really a good partner does for a long time. So I came in as uh, my job was called general manager of their direct consumer business in North America. So specifically what I was doing was creating a new product line. Cause if you think about what, what Experian was so let me back up a little bit. Experience, direct consumer business, were the ones responsible for those freecreditreport.com commercials, yeah. if you remember them. Yeah, yeah. So they were a huge company. That that sort of ad campaign was, I mean, it's all public. I can't remember what they were making back before I joined them, but and it was something, it was over a billion a year in mm -hmm. revenue. And just to be clear, Credit.com and Credit Karma, all these other companies, we never could have grown if it weren't for all the money Experian had spent on these ads. So Experian had basically created a market mm -hmm. for people to buy credit reports and scores. And I mean, we were called Credit.com when I would check into a hotel or, you know, check into an airline and I would have my Credit.com credit card. They'd be like, I've seen your commercials and I, for a long time, I was like, well, that's not us. Finally, I just started to say, well, I'm glad you like them, you know, because um, we had such a generic name. But um, so I think that the, the the bottom line was they were spending so much money on marketing that- You benefited from it. From the... Oh, totally. We yeah. read the coattails of it. Like, yeah, yeah. So ride, I mean, uh, I'm peeling out, you know, kind of nuggets and one is, you, you know, you- Riding the tales of you know a, a rising tide, um, you know, credit uh, having good journalists write good good content, right? Like quality. It's not not like a. I, I don't get the sense that you're a content farm machine, right? Like you you had real journalists doing good ed editorial work. Um, yeah, so it's it's really good to hear some of, some of these stories because I've, I've been wanting to learn more about um, yeah how you built this as content business essentially yeah well i mean you know the content business um it's very different now but at the time it's like you know just like following experience um huge marketing spend you're following macro events i consider their spend was big enough that it was a macro event mm -hmm. the problems journalists were having like we were able to in a very small way both help and capitalize on it by you know but but the common thread was quality for sure. Like, you know, we never went gimmicky. We never wrote cheap content. In fact, it was a incredibly, you know, big expense. Mm -hmm. um, but relative to what we got in return for it, it was peanuts, right? Mm -hmm. And then I think, you know, with, with uh, the, the value proposition we had behind the content was free. It's pretty easy to, to sell free, right? Right. So you know, the whole story just came together very nicely there. And, but when I joined Experian, they were, their sales, not for the entire business, but for the direct to consumer business were declining 
Precisely because companies like Credit Karma and Credit.com are giving away their stuff for free. So I was charged with building a new line of business there. Um, uh, I won't get too much into that, but it's uh, it's on their site now. It's called Credit Match. And it's interesting. Basically, it just it's a very commonsensical model for a big data broker like Experian, where essentially they know the underwriting models for the banks. So they're not, I mean, these are private proprietary models, but, you know, with all the right consents and discussions, you know, if you think about what, what a company like Experian can ultimately do is take those underwriting models and know with certainty whether or not somebody can get approved mm-hmm. with extreme certainty. I, I, so, so look, we, that was a, a super fun um, thing to build. I'm not a big company person. I, I, I definitely found it difficult to adapt to that culture, but what was super fun was working with giant data sets and, you know, working with these cross-functional teams and trying to leverage all the assets that the company had to build this awesome site and awesome set of tools. Uh, that was my, my naive side was, this is going to be great. And it was great, but the, the truth of getting anything done at a large company is, you know, um, it, it just takes longer for, yeah totally legitimate reasons. But uh, so anyway, after Experian, I had a pretty short run there. It was at about two years and um, I was traveling, you know, quite a bit back then. Some of the, some of the trips were great. Like, Where'd you uh, go? Barcelona, the UK. Um, but mostly I went to, to uh, Costa Mesa in Orange County uh, four to five days a week for two years. And that was, less fun you know my my exercise routine was gone uh so anyway i left experian and um just dabbled around in in some seed investing and some consulting work i was working with a few different investors uh and and just love that i love that um you know i'd follow along on some of the investments but what's really interesting there is you know one, working inside your field of expertise and finding those nuggets, those rare entrepreneurs that have found a new angle in a very, very crowded field. But the other thing that was interesting is going into other areas where I had done a lot less work like edge computing. And I've been, you know, for years, a common thread for me was um, what, what we called at credit.com consumer permissioned data which to me is tantamount to privacy. So what that means is like one of the big differences of what we did at credit.com versus the way credit works normally, and you could apply this to many other things besides credit, is that when you, and I believe this is true at Credit Karma too, and I'm sure it is, when you go and get your data, and I'll just say, I'll stick to credit.com because I can talk about it with authority. When you came there and we gave you the data, that data was yours, not ours. So it was consumer permissioned. And, and when that when it was consum- consumer permissioned, a lot of the restrictions around the data disappeared. Um, meaning that like when you're pulling credit on somebody behind the scenes to send them, send like if you're a credit card company and you get one of those, you've been pre-approved offers in the mail, they had to pull one credit pool to do that one letter. When you own the data, you're allowed to do whatever you want with your own data. So you can pre-qualify on a hundred different offers for that one pool. You know, it's, it's not exactly like that. The point is you own the data. And I, I just believed in that um, fundamentally. And, and, and I tried to apply that to a bunch of other areas and for a long time, really worked hard in the background to make a new own your own data model. And I have a spreadsheet of like the 26 companies who have tried to do that and not <laughs> and, and fail. So we, we've uh, had a few startups come this way, our way to try to design an experience around owning your own data. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, well, I mean, look, uh, the browser Brave did it, but you know, before Brave, you had Firefox. Mozilla was trying to do this, and the the trouble the trouble is if there are there were the browser approaches, there were the exchange approaches where you would make money, there was the blockchain approaches, but the common thread that failed was the value prop being that you would get paid for your data. And I still see people trying to do this. And it, it's, it's just the, 
there's not enough money to incentivize people to, to do this. Mm-hmm. It's not a you know strong value prop. Yeah. Especially when you consider the consequences of like Facebook and what happened with Facebook. And I can name any number of events. Like, you know, I'm super sorry that, you know, you've been hacked or lied to. Um, here's five bucks for the month, you know? Like, right. And the other thing that's really going on is that the third party data you can get and the value of that for the average ad network is so low compared to what Google and Facebook and Amazon can get on you. And they don't need third party data. They're first party that you have a first party relationship with Google, right? Mm -hmm. You go there and you use them, you use Google analytics, you use Gmail, you use, I mean, just about everything you use has something to do with Google. Same with Amazon and Facebook. So they don't need third party data. So long story short, value prop being money will pay you for your data doesn't work. We were looking at it at a very micro level. Like, what if we did this, um, like, you know, uh, next door and really did it at the super local merchant level. And so we had all the good causes behind us, but uh, we were, we, me and a few um, friends were trying to figure out how to do this. And these were some brilliant minds, you know, I'm not, I'm excluding myself from some really smart folks in data science, just trying to figure it out. But at the end of the day, the value prop can't be, money it has to be something more fundamental that you care about and so so fast forward a little bit here um so i was working with a couple different companies um via a private equity firm and a couple other investors and uh i i was also working a little bit with adam's other company called cyber scout and they were recently purchased by Sontic. there was a press release on that but I knew I had known that company for many, many years. I loved what they did. So what they had, what they were doing essentially was they were servicing the insurance industry. And so when, you know, MetLife customers, and I hope I get this right. So um, the caveat being, I'm, I'm trying to recreate this in my mind, but basically insurance companies were starting to give away identity theft protection. And eventually mm-hmm. this became cyber protection, which is a much bigger market now. If anything happened to their customers, Cyber Scout would step in and help the customer, you know, retrieve their identity and clean up their files legally, credit and everything else. And they were not they were not uh, incentivized by time on the phone or anything like that. They were encouraged. They were incentivized by just giving the best possible service. So yeah, they built this company around that, and they were purchased. Um, but I, I also knew that the CEO that had come in two years before they sold her two and a half years was a good friend of mine. She left Experian shortly after I did. She was the president of the affinity group at Experian. Um, awesome CEO, uh, Jen Luer, and she came in there. And, um, so I felt like I spent some time with that company and I noticed that I was looking at the, the, you know, what, what the what the claims were about when, when somebody got hacked, when a company got hacked, what was the root cause? What was causing, you know, a lot of these attacks? And so you, you read about these nation state attacks like solar winds or the Sony breach, but 90% of most of these incidents were actually uh, originated with, you know, phishing and ransomware. And you dig into sort of what does it take to be successful at a phishing campaign? So there's like, run-of-the-mill phishing where you just send out a dumb email and you hope somebody doesn't pay attention and you click on a, a link. But there's the next level of, you know, much more sophisticated attacks like spear phishing and ransomware attacks where I basically can learn so much about you legally from 112 different data brokers that are unregulated in the U.S. And I don't want to get sued, so I'm not going to go naming them. But Look, I, I'll tell you this. I, I had used a lot of these data brokers to, to look myself up over the years because, one, I was curious, too. I had to often fill out these complicated licenses. Like, I would apply for state licenses because I worked in financial services. So I, th- I would get these questionnaires about where have you lived since you were 18 years old. I'm like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> so I'd look my, I'd do a background search on myself. But then on these sites... If you, if you haven't gone on some of these sites, like, you know, I think um, been verified and some yeah. of them are better than others, but some of them will, will say like, 
do you know if your neighbor is a criminal? Hmm. Um, we just check to see if there's a criminal, uh, you know, file on you. And of course, there could be a criminal file on anybody, but it's pretty enticing to hit the button. Like, what do you mean? Is there a mistake? Why do I have a background record? And then you pay $10 to find out you don't. Um, but basically what they're trying to do is get you to forget about their motivation, which you can do on these sites if you're savvy enough is buy data on anybody that you want. Mm -hmm. So I can figure out enough about Peck to, you know, know pretty much your extended family, where you live, if you're in debt and a whole bunch of other stuff, even before you get to the dark web or any of the more right, you know, sophisticated right. stuff. So, so look, hence there's so much, there's so much data floating around that privacy and security have become inter, inter, intertwined, right? So when you have privacy this violated, right? As it is today, it becomes a security issue as well as a, you know, privacy for the sake of privacy issue. And so you see these laws developing around privacy, like in the EU, you have what's called GDPR um, in, in the US, I have a map. There's like every state has a different regulation, but mostly people follow California yeah. and, and every, every country in the world has it. Long story short. Uh, so I got super interested in this and that's why I found it a locker. Um, and yeah, I could see where this is going <laughs> from, from yeah. the storytelling. Like it's the, you know, the, the way to what you're doing now is uh, it's like, Oh, okay. I, I can see how this kind of led you to here. Yeah, well, look, it's it's a, it's a windy road, um, you know, and I think you'll find that a lot of folks, you know, early internet folks, um, I mean, because it was developing, you know, have these kind of windy careers. So my, I think mine was particularly windy, but, um, you know, I've been interested in privacy for such a long time that so the, the decision was, you know, continue working in consumer data and just leverage my experience there. Or, or try to actually fulfill this mission I've been trying to fulfill for a long time of how do you create a more private internet? So that's what we're working on. And I, I mean, the, the long and short of it is, I don't want to get into, you know, the nuts and bolts of, you know, exactly what we do, but I, the problem now is the way the internet runs, like the infrastructure of the internet is based mostly on cloud applications and third-party applications, which don't, you know, go through the core site. So, I mean, I think you know this, but like if you go to Marriott.com, not to pick on Marriott, but, um, and, you know, almost any site, we'll take Marriott.com as an example. Um, a lot of the transactions that you pack in your browser are having are not between you and Marriott, they're between you and a third party that Marriott is contracted with to deliver services, whether they're calendar services, you know, tags that are helping track you or any other, other number marketing of marketing tools, analytic tools. And Correct. Correct. Yeah. So anyway, that's what we're doing now, but the, 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 the marching order here is privacy. And uh, so I think we're in the midst of a pretty big sea change around privacy, just based on the, the fact that people are actually getting fined serious amounts of money for the first time. So I've been hearing about privacy and how much everybody cares about it at the corporate levels for, for 20 years. But um, mostly it was lip service. And we all cared. But the question is, if you're running a company, you can only care about so many things a day. Yeah. So now this has become one of the things that you actually need to think about every day, um, yeah. especially if you're a company that's holding sensitive data. So anyway. Um, so are I'll, you using I'll, uh, content marketing to also get business and eyeballs to this new company? Oh yeah. I mean, so, so you want to come up over the radar at the right time, but absolutely. Like I, I, so I've lined up a whole bunch of privacy attorneys and uh, other kinds of folks that, that will be doing um, almost all content marketing. Um, look, it's the best way to do it. Let, let me tell you why, like, let me go back to credit.com for a minute. Um, so think about this ties into privacy too. Think about, all the work you do to try to hyper target somebody using paid media and retargeting and how you cross tab everything. And then there was this old Seinfeld episode where Kramer actually got 
the his number was mixed up for the number for movie phone. I don't know if you remember this. Uh, yeah, I vaguely remember that episode. Yeah. Yeah. So people would call Kramer, and he, being you know the quirky character he was, would um, pretend to be movie phone. So people would call up, and you know he'd say, "Hey, welcome to movie phone." You know, and then you'd hear him say, "You know, enter your five digit zip code," and you'd hear five beeps, and of course he couldn't do anything with that, so he'd say why don't you just tell me where you live, you know? And so we, but that approach of why don't you just tell me what you want is really what content marketing is about. So let's take a, a real example. So we built the whole company around, if I can remember right, I think four or five questions. Like, it was like, what is my credit? You know, why should I care? What can I do about it? But but let me not try to get get it exactly right and just say, look, we built this higher answer questions, right? Answer what questions people have. Yeah. Organic questions. And we yeah. subdivided those questions into five more questions. And we tested those against what was pe- what was actually happening in Google search. And we carried that all the way down to the keywords so that when we, we had a hierarchy, so anything you wrote about was structured around answering a question that somebody had. So we didn't write to answer just those questions. We wrote about interesting news that was happening, Mm -hmm. but we structured the, the links. We structured how we categorize the article based on that hierarchy that I'm talking about. Questions subdivided into other questions, subdivided into keywords, subdivided into other kind of metadata and meta description. So, um, Let's get super specific now. So we wrote an article around debt collection. We had a wonderful writer. I don't know where she is now. Um, maybe Nerd Wallet, um, but Jerry Detweiler. And she wrote an article about what are your rights? Um, this was you know, shortly after the financial crisis. What are your rights um, in a particular state if you're over 65? And a debt collector calls you, right? And so we had an article, what, what are your rights if a debt collector calls you? And then it had more specific sections and sub articles around it. But let's just think about what you can do with that now. So by the time somebody comes to the site, I know they came from, let's say Yahoo. I know which section of Yahoo, Yahoo Finance. And they specifically wanted to know that, I know the, the title of the article is, what are your rights if a debt collector calls you? Okay. And I know what state, you know, cause you clicked on, I infer that you clicked on, well, I live in Florida and I want to know my rights if I'm over 65. So by the time the person comes to you, you've just asked them what they want mm-hmm. by proxy of, you know, following just good writing. So instead of trying to reverse engineer through complex machine learning, what somebody wants and who they are, the concept is just freaking ask them. Yeah, but also follow the journey of their content. You kind of got the answers, right? Is that? Yeah, well, the link would literally be, well, we knew the link because it was our article. And if the link was, see your rights if you're over 65 and a debt collector calls you, we know exactly what you want. It doesn't even matter who you are. We know what you want, right? Mm -hmm. And so I could extrapolate that into any number of articles like, you know, I just moved and I need to figure, I just moved or I just applied for a mortgage and got rejected. Um, And so we've, you know, got hundreds of articles about that, right? So we would know which outlet they came in on was a publishing Forbes, MSN, Yahoo. Cause remember we would syndicate our content out. It wasn't just on Mm credit.com. So we had, you know, I don't remember probably a hundred different publications that we would syndicate to on various, you know, um, either every day, every week, every month, even some local newspapers. So, so it's a really interesting business and, and, and you can figure out an awful lot by just having the, the breadth of content and good organization around your links. So I don't know if I'm getting too far in the weeds on it, but. No, this is really useful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, like, it's just super interesting. Now content marketing today, everybody's trying to do it. And I, I love when I call an agency and they try to explain pillar pages to me. And I'm like, I, I know, I, you know, I, I get it. There's a, but, but one thing I'd say is that at the, at the core of it is authenticity, right? Like people just have a, especially, you know, millennials, they, they just have a sixth <laughs> sense for bullshit, right? Yeah. 
And you just, it's so important that you find a writer that's writing in a beat that they care about and really, really, you know, that they clearly understand their space. So getting people that just write generic articles about whatever, or follow the news articles where you're basically following headlines. There's no real service in that. There is some value to your site in doing that, but you have to ultimately realize like, what's your goal here? Are you actually helping somebody, um, you know, answer a fundamental question, which is what Google search is all about, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody's trying to learn something sometimes out of curiosity, but usually out of a, uh, you know, a question or trying to answer. Yeah. Yeah, What are you trying to answer? Yeah. What is the need you're trying to solve? Yeah. So, yeah, we're going to focus on, on, on that. And really also, I think one of the things that I find really frustrating, I used to find really frustrating in credit and I find it very frustrating in privacy now if you, a lot of the content out there is super academic. Um, and, you know, it, it, it comes down to, I still believe there's a, a, enough companies out there that do want to do the right thing, right? But it's super hard, like getting the right tools and, you know, to actually follow some of these regulations is not simple. Yeah, so Locker, you know, basically what we say is we're, 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 we've created privacy for the other half of the internet. And so what we mean by that is that, so right now, most of us use cloud applications. We rent software. We don't build our own email service provider. Well, let me, let me rephrase that. Giant companies like Google and Walmart might, right? But most companies, um, they rent, rent a lot of their software. So Most of their software. Most of their software. So actually, yeah. Akamai reported 67% of all the calls that they saw transactions rather in 2020 um, that came through their CDM were third-party calls. So these third-party calls live completely between the, the client, your browser, and a third party that you're completely unaware of. And at the very least, they're collecting your IP address in your session, you know, browsing history. Um, so we've created a tool that basically uh allows companies to use all of the third-party software they're using, but completely control it. Meaning that like the default state of what we allow them to do is they don't have to share any customer data on the client side with any third party. So that, that from a compliance perspective, that really, that kind of the, the, the default state we want to set is start off with zero trust and share data with nobody like in this right. sandbox. And then, decide who you want to share data with. Like clearly you, if you're using Tableau, you want to share the data with Tableau so you can get the results back from Tableau. But if you set this as your default state for not just your core domain, but all your subdomains, if you're a CISO and you've got a global purview, right? You, it's nearly impossible to control what happens on the client side of JavaScript. So, so anyway, we give you that control to very specifically share the data you want to share and nothing else and set that as your default. And we're giving away a free scan um, in about a week. Our site's live now. You can yeah. go in there. It's like privacy and settings for your site. What's that? Almost kind of like privacy settings for your site. Like what, what you choose to share. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So you can set privacy settings for your first party, you know? Yeah. Uh, content, but the third parties, your customers are exposed to all of these third parties. And that's why there are all these reactions. So we've created a fix for that. That's super powerful. Um, and just as a teaser, we put out a, on our site today, you can go on locker.com and run a free scan of any URL page to see actually where your data is going. And we built this for businesses. Like we're, we're not trying to uh, you know, give anybody a bad name here. We're trying to give business owners visibility to what's actually happening to all their customers' content. And so we're giving away the free scan and then the, the tool that we created sits in line 24 seven and gives the site owner complete control over the client side. I mean, which is most of the internet at this point. So yeah. super excited to be doing that. And um yeah, I could talk about that for an hour. <laughs> yeah, so, a half hour ago. We, we, yeah, we should uh, revisit this uh, 
you know, have you at a, as a, we have, a, you know, once we have enough episodes, re recurring guests and get some progress updates. Yeah, I, I encourage anyone to try, go to locker, L-O-K-K-E-R.com and just put in your site and see how many third-party applications or have access to your customer data. Yeah, it's a free tool. Uh, use it. You'll be extremely surprised. So, <laughs> all right. All right. Um, well, thank you so much. Of course. Yeah. Take care. All right. All right. Thank you, Ian. Bye-bye. Right, have a good one.